Hi, welcome to Write More Light. My name is Sarah of Midwest Writing Center, and I'm excited today to talk about my favorite thing to write, um, which is the letter. I, um, I'll use the term epistolary and the, and the word letter interchangeably, and um, I don't know, I apologize in advance for that. I prefer to talk about the letter because that is um, where the epistolary comes alive for me. Um, but technically speaking, epistolary can be really anything um, written, <laughs> it gets hard here. Um, it, it's generally a diary or a letter, um, but it can also be really any kind of correspondence. So um, if you've read a book written in emails or text messages, um, or like grocery lists, um, those are all epistolaries too. Um, personally, my, my sweet spot is with the letter. Um, I write them, uh, as standalone pieces, one-offs, um, and generally I write them, uh, to real people and then, um, I don't know, fictionalize them with edits. Um, there's the little preview I forgot to mention. At the end of the video, we will talk about what's up, what's coming up at the Midwest Writing Center and um, have a free write. I'm betting y'all can guess right now what the free write's gonna be. Uh, <laughs> okay, so um, why? Why use the letter? Why use the epistolary? Um, it can do one of two things. I'm, you know, generalizing, dumbing it down a bit, but um, it can either be very, very casual and or very, very poetic. Um, there's something in, it's always very familiar. And the reason for that is, um, when you're writing correspondence, it's usually to someone you know, right? Um, and it's not like you can't write a formal letter like you would yeah, I don't know, when you're learning how to write letters in class where you're supposed to like write a business letter or whatever, it that absolutely can be a thing and can be done really well um, and can make a huge, beautiful statement, particularly if you're like making a political statement with it. Um, but I think most of the time we choose to write a letter because it's so easy to do it in the familiar. Um, the the beauty of the epistolary form is the freedom to be familiar you you have this full luxury of saying how you really feel of talking to someone you're either very close to or not close to and um you know have something to say it's um there's a, a level of urgency to the epistolary this needs to be said this needs to be said now and i'm saying it um obviously you know i i would say that we we're never going to just run with the rough draft. Um, but even in, in edits, you get to keep this familiarity and this, this urgency and, and add to it. And that, um, that makes it very, very effective. And I think a little easier to do. <laughs> um, and something that's, that's exciting about that, right, is um, when you read a letter, the reader becomes the addressee, which, you know, maybe is cheating, um, <laughs> but it, uh, it adds, it adds a level of personalness, right? If I'm reading this letter and I feel like it's to me, um, that puts the reader into the immediacy of this correspondence and it puts the reader, um, into a, a personal relationship with the writer. Now, you know, you can totally, totally write fictional letters and, um, that's a whole genre on its own, right? Um, the epistolary novel has a million, a million, a million, let me say a million again, um, <laughs> uh, iterations and they're well-loved and they're done over and over and over again, you know? Um, I think there's no way to understate that, right? Like there's no um, arena in fiction that is, uh, separated or like there's no arena of fiction in which you can't use the epistolary like it just doesn't exist um or it is universal in that way um the martian by i think weir is the last name of the author of the martian um uh, which i haven't read but that's an epistolary 
and that's sci-fi. Um, we've got, of course, uh, Frankenstein is written in letters and diary entries of Dracula, letters and diary entries. Um, the princess diaries are obviously diary entries. Um, what's her name? Meg Cabot, I believe, is the author of the princess diaries. Um, she does a lot a lot of epistolaries and they work for her and she's very wealthy. Um, so it's obviously um, universally useful. And it's also something that we see in nonfiction too, of course, because we write letters. Um, but when I say nonfiction, I mean like uh, Ta-Nehisi Coates' Between the World and Me, which I have here, I was going to read the first page as an example. Um, and of course there's letters that we write as correspondence. There's, you know, letters to the editor, and there's letters to um, organizations and corporations and friends and family. Um, it's truly in in nonfiction, right? We've got Anne Frank's diary, um, which I think I don't know. I think that was like required reading in school, but um, it's obviously nonfiction. There's, it's, I think so easy to do as a creative form because we're really if you're doing nonfiction with it um we're letting ourselves speak from oh i don't know the most eloquent parts of our hearts um obviously i've already said this is a favorite form for me um but i think that so um, I get made fun of a lot in, in my life for not being eloquent at all when I speak. And um, I think that's super rude, by the way. Don't do that to people. Um, but, you know, when I'm writing, I feel much more eloquent. And that's not because I get to edit later. Um, it's just easier to process words slowly, right? It's easier to process language for me with my hand. Um, and I feel like there's a level of honesty too, that um, again, it can be fictional and still be honest. Um, so that's clear. I will stand by that. I don't think that fiction means untrue or dishonest. It just means that this isn't a true story. Um, <laughs> um, but I think that there's a level of honesty that comes with trying to express a truth without having the person immediately in front of you. And I think that's really important for writers to at least exercise with, at least um, work with this level of honesty and vulnerability, even if you know it doesn't go anywhere. Um, I think I'm gonna get into examples and then um, do a little more talk. So I'm gonna start out with Ta-Nehisi Coates, Between the World and Me, and that is how his name is pronounced. If, um, if you've ever stumbled over that. Um, I'm just gonna start out from the first page. I believe um, all of his books are epistolary, but I don't know that for sure. He's a journalist um, and I've only read this one, I think, of his books. Um, he has several, of course. Um, so this entire book, it's like 250 pages, 200 pages, a little less looks very thick though, um, is a letter to his son. And there's like different chapters, but it's all directed directly to his son. And in fact, I don't know if you can see that, the first word is son, comma, new line. <laughs> Last Sunday, the host of a popular news show asked me what it meant to lose my body. The host was broadcasting from Washington, DC, and I was seated in a remote studio on the far west side of Manhattan. A satellite closed the gap between us, but no machinery could close the gap between her world and the world for which I had been summoned to speak. When the host asked me about my body, her face faded from the screen and what was replaced and was replaced by a scroll of words written by me earlier that week. Um, so that could have just been in first person. It didn't have to be in second person, right? For this um, opening paragraph, um, he goes on and, and uses the direct address a lot later in this book. Um, but it is a way to, I think, back away from the first person 
uh, when you're writing letters, of course, if you're doing it in journal entries, diary entries, um, then it is, of course, just um, a lot more confessional than it is direct address. Um, so he does eventually get into you and what I want for your future and what um, what why I'm writing this to you. Um, but I think that's a really solid example of how it doesn't necessarily need to at all points be direct about the addressee. Um, a lot of the times the, um, the magic of the direct address, the, the epistolary, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the letter is that it gives you as a writer some space to back up from um, from your own thoughts because you're you're seeing them as directed to another person. I think that's um, I think that's an important use. So now I'm going to go ahead and um, screen share. We're going to go into fiction. This is from a novel by Matthew Quick called The Good Luck of Right Now. And um, it's a really, really fun and sweet and good book um, about learning who you are, really. Um, yeah, this I just looked up excerpt, an excerpt for the beginning of the book, and here it is. Uh, chapter one, the you, me, Richard Gear of pretending. Dear Mr. Richard Gear, in my mom's underwear drawer, as I was separating her personal clothes from the lightly used articles I could donate to the local thrift shop, I found a letter you wrote. As you will recall, your letter was about the 2008 Olympics held in Beijing, China. You were advocating for a boycott because of the crimes and atrocities the Chinese government committed against Tibet. Don't worry, I'm not one of those crazy types. I immediately realized that this was a form letter you sent out to millions of people through your charitable organization, but mom was a good enough pretender to believe you had personally signed the letter specifically to her, which is most likely why she saved it, believing you had touched the paper with your hands, licked the envelope with your tongue, imagining the paper represented a tangible link to you, that maybe a few of your cells, microscopic bits of your DNA were with her whenever she held the letter and envelope. Mom was your biggest fan and a season's pretender. There's his name written in cursive, I remember you saying to me, poking the paper with your index finger from Richard Gere, movie star Richard Gere. Mom liked to celebrate the little things, like finding a forgotten wrinkled dollar in a lint-ridden coat pocket, or when there was no line at the post office and the stamp sellers were up for smiles and polite conversation, or when it was cool enough to sit out back during a hot summer when the temperature dips dramatically at night, even though the weatherman has predicted unbearable humidity and heat, and therefore the evening becomes an unexpected gift. Come enjoy the strange cool air, Bartholomew, Bartholomew, mom would say, and we'd sit outside and smile at each other like we'd just won the lottery. Mom could make small things seem miraculous. That was her talent. Richard Gere, perhaps you have already labeled mom as weird, pixelated. Most people did. Before she got sick, she never gained or lost weight. She never purchased new clothes for herself and therefore was perpetually stuck in mid eighties fashion. She smelled like mothballs, like the mothballs she kept in her drawers and closet and her hair was usually flattened on the side she rested against her pillow, almost always the left. Um, I think I'm gonna stop there. Um, actually, I'm gonna go out of here. Mom didn't know that the computer printers could easily reproduce signatures because she was too old to have ever employed modern technology. Toward the end, she used to say that computers were condemned by the book of revelations, but Father McNamee told me that that's not true, although we could let mom believe it was. I'd never seen her so happy as the day your letter arrived. As you might've gathered, mom wasn't all there during the last few years of her life. And by the, by the end, and by the very end, extreme dementia had set in, which made it hard to distinguish the pretending of her final days from the real world. Right now I'm gonna stop. Uh, so I think Bartholomew, right, um, is the main character there, the narrator, um, and he is writing a letter to Richard Gere, the the actor, <laughs> um, and it's very confessional. And he does direct address. He says specifically to you, Richard Gere, and the whole book is written in a series of letters to Richard Gere, the actor. Um, 
And it's, it's very confessional. He's, ex, he's, he's building up an explanation of who his mother is. I believe he believes Richard Gere is his father. Um, or maybe his mother told him Richard Gere is his father. Anyway, uh, really, really fun and like very heartfelt, like good book in addition to being fun. Um, and what a premise, right? Um, but it's very confessional. It's very thoughtful. He has something that he's getting to, something important to say uh, to Richard Gere. So I think a, another part of the beauty of the letter is that it's very confessional and very much about the speaker, despite being to someone, despite being veiled as correspondence. I know that's how I work um, when I do write nonfiction letters. Um, it's from a place where I really, I really have something to say to you. Um, and then, you know, I edit it later and it's, um, <laughs> I edit it for, uh, for art's sake and um, maybe sacrifice a little bit of the truth or change some details or whatever. Um, but it's always very much, I need to say this thing. And it's about getting it off my chest um, less than it is making sure the addressee receives information, right? Um, that's not to say that that's not an important motive, right? Um, we write letters as correspondents to communicate with people. I mean, that's what communication is. Um, so of course it is also important much of the time that the addressee is receiving this information. But um, some of the beauty of, of the letter is that it's confessional and it can be deeply, deeply personal without the addressee mattering all that much, especially if your reader is going to act as the addressee. It can be um, a really excellent way of I don't want to say manipulating the reader, um, but that is what I mean. <laughs> um, another cool thing is you can be a little vague if you're writing it as like familiar correspondence. That isn't so much what is happening in um, either of the pieces that I've shared so far. Um, the Bartholomew, the the writer in. Uh, or the speaker in The Good Luck of Right Now hasn't met Richard Gere. So he's not like, hey, buddy, remember that time we did that thing? <clears throat> and ta Coates is writing to his infant son. Um, so I very much imagine he does not um, talk about shared memories between the um, addressee and the writer. Uh, however, that's sort of a wonderful gift that you receive when you do the epistolary. You don't have to give all the details. And in fact, um, some of the artistry can be in how you give the details. There's a lot of summary involved in, in the epistolary, especially in letter writing, where um, you, know, you want the audience to know as a piece of writing, you want the audience to know what's going on, but you also want it to be a convincing piece of correspondence. So um, both people involved, the reader and the writer, are familiar with whatever is being described, but where the the pretty language and the um, summary comes in, the, the movement of the piece comes in, is in those moments when you can say, and I mean this, this is like a, a, a cheat code, you just need to be discerning about when you use it. Um, remember when we met at the cafe across the street from the middle school and they were out of onions and you cried. It was in that moment that I first found I loved you. I made all of that up just now. Um, but the, the key is you can get into those really beautiful moments by saying, remember when. Um, again, you wanna be careful about that, right? Um, if you're, if you do it too much, it, well, can either be a theme or a trope or whatever, but um, it can really bring your audience out of the moment. Like if you write a full, full length novel, that's an epistolary in the form of like a diary entry and you keep giving details, um, you're gonna want an, an excuse to be so detailed. Um, like why, 
why would I document every detail of my day if I just, if I'm going to remember it? Um, so if I'm keeping this diary as um, a time capsule or capsule or um, um, I'm keeping records specifically to keep records, right? Um, these are things to consider in the beginning when you're, when you're working on, um, on developing the piece. You want to know, um, you want to know the purpose of the, of the epistolary. You want to know why it's happening um, as the writer. So now um, we're going to go to LitHub. I'm going to do another screen share. We're going to go to LitHub and um, look at, not that, a letter to John Lewis, which is, um, I assume, um, this is really beautiful and I would call it more like prose poetry. Um, I'm not going to read the whole thing, but I encourage you to. I'll throw it in the comments at some point. Um, and then we're going to go to LitHub on a different page and um, talk about a piece that I read um, last year for a class that reminded me of all the versatility of the epistolary. Mm -hmm. I think first I will screen share and then I will share the link. To John Lewis, whose strength and sweetness never faltered, by Nikki Finney. Dear John Robert Lewis, there was a colossal sweetness about you that some mistook for weakness, a sweetness that seemed to power your actions and your life. Seems to me it was a particular kind of sweetness that was perhaps given to you, taught to you, perhaps by your large and loving family, and also taught again, perhaps by all the tambourining and lightning bolt words you soon discovered in those second and third hand books in the small segregated schoolhouse in Pike County, Alabama. Those same books that you soon learned were the perfect size for marching off into battle with. John Robert Lewis, the sweetness I speak of continued to be nurtured in you, even as you grew from black boy stowed away in a corner of the American South to a black man walking the halls of Congress for 13 terms from the fifth district of Georgia, even as men who did not know your powerful sweetness charged at you on bridges with nightsticks and bully punches, intending to beat the love out of you. The love that seems to me fragments of which might have been found inside some of those books you always kept close in your backpack. It was never a secret how much you adored books and how they gave you the power to love people back, no matter what. I've been looking for your Kilimanjaro sweetness everywhere. I need it now more than ever. I don't want it like a pill I might pop when my anger rises with the news of the day. I want it like a backpack, something I might pull on and tighten around my shoulders and not take off until it is time for bed. Something heavy that has the power to pull my shoulder pull back my shoulders, a John Robert Lewis backpack, jetpack, power pack filled with the powerful sweetness in the face of no matter what. A fueled thing that would lift me away from all this hatred when I need it to. I've been trying to keep what you taught me, taught me top of my mind because I really want to, because what I really want to do is punch every booming, bombastic, ruthless liar in the mouth. People are dying because of lies. Hundreds of thousands of people dying and losing everything they have worked for because some people do not care if they live or die. I've not been feeling very nonviolent since you left. And so I decided to begin my new days here on earth without your marching feet as one of my sonic compasses here in my trusty writing chair engaged in the great epistolary tradition of reaching out to you in the only way I truly trust. Tonight, I am remembering that sweet story of you wanting to go to school when you were six or so, your father waking you early that one morning to tell you to go to the fields to work rather than to school to read that story and so many others about you was sent back and forth across the community switchboard during the week of your crossing over. I can hear the rich inflection of your Southern voice as you retell that story of how you hid beneath the porch, waiting for the right moment to hightail it to the school bus in order to sneak a day in without the <clears throat> in order to sneak a day in with the books before paying back the two days in the field that you owed your father. John Robert Lewis, you are a boy who, I dare say, would never disobey his father unless, of course, there was a book involved. 
You and I both know that sweetness can often be attracted to disobedience, that it can follow a boy or a girl until they begin to understand its full power, and only then can they heed its call. I'm talking about the sweetness that can sometimes be found in books, a kind of sweetness that can even rival the, that unrivaled moment of preaching to chickens in the backyard or staring straight up at the coal black country sky, dreaming of one day leaving all that never ending sweat and dirt for the blinking lights of the city. I might be wrong about that. Send me a sign, John Robert Lewis. Let me know for sure. You were a Dust Bowl boy born a generation after the bull weevil and the great migration. And therefore there were so many reasons you could have, but never did leave the South. The South where you first handed, where you were first handed a beat up book and locked out of every library, but you never left us. We know this like we know our family names. Ugh, I really wanted to read this whole thing. It is so beautiful. Um, but you can see, I'm going to stop share. Um, but you can see how, you can see how this is poetry. And you can see how, despite this being a bit of a biography about John Lewis, this is so much an, an asking, so deeply personal. Um, and, and, and the weaving together of those two is, is seamless because in, in the direct address, it, I mean, because she's incredibly talented and probably edited this many times over, um, but she's looking to a hero to, um, I'm gonna be really embarrassed if Nikki is not a woman. Yes, okay, Nikki is a woman. Um, she's looking for something specific and she knows who to ask it of and so we learn a lot about her through what she admires and what she needs from john lewis sorry i am now um putting this letter into the chat thank you for bearing with me Oh, okay, thanks. Uh, <laughs> I um, I'm going to, I think, end this relatively soon. I'm going to put another letter. Um, this one more in a more traditional um, poetic format in the chat here, and the bit from the Good Luck of Right Now. Um. I hope um, I hope you go on to read epistolaries. I um, I find it easiest to write when I'm being myself, and I think that that um, I think that that is something the epistolary offers. I have said this a few times, and I want to reiterate it: you don't have to write nonfiction to be writing letters. Um, but I think something about first person often sort of tricks you into being yourself, right? Um, that's not universal, of course, um, but it does happen, especially if you sit down to write a letter. Um, the reader becomes the addressee, which makes the piece personal, and it makes it easier in some ways, I mean, harder some in some ways, like emotionally, but easier in some ways to um, get that, um, there's a word for what I'm saying, but get, you, you get the reader to, to sign on to what you're doing sort of accidentally by including them in the piece, which makes a big difference. Um, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna call it there. I think that I have more, uh, more passion than I have instruction on this, um, on this topic. And I don't want to get too wordy or say um too many more times, but uh, <laughs> um, so if you're gonna take off without hearing about what's up the right more light, uh, what's up with the Midwest Writing Center, then you're silly, you should stick around. So um, this weekend, we're accepting applications through the weekend for the Young Emerging Writers Internship. Um, today is May 11th, definitely May 11th. Um, and uh, yeah, so um, our deadline is May 15th, but we'll, we'll accept through the weekend for the Young Emerging Writers Internship. That is a paid internship for writers age 15 to 19. Um, it's going to be all virtual this year again um, with the, the pandemic going on. We're gonna hope, hopefully do a couple of live events outdoors, but you never know, there is still a pandemic going on. Um, 
we meet Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday evenings for a few hours. Um, we'll have a couple of readings and we're going to teach on writing. We're going to teach on workshopping and we're going to put together a full, beautiful never prepared with the Atlas Am I? Uh, literary magazine. It is a gorgeous publication um, and our interns end up published in a beautiful book um, that they put together. We learn about design and it's a wonderful experience. Um, highly encourage <laughs> um, all, all, young, all young writers to apply. Um, it's free to apply. And if there are any uh, worries about tech, um, we're also happy to make accommodations for, for folks who are worried they won't be able to, to connect with us. Um, I will also say you can email in your applications. I think the application process makes it sound like you must mail your application and you can email it. And that is to mwc at midwestwritingcenter.org. Okay, so next Saturday, May 22nd, so not this week, but next, um, we have our first outdoor live reading of the year. We're gonna do that at Roz Talks. Our, um, our partners and friends um, on Third Avenue, Third Avenue in Rock Island. Um, it's gonna be really great. We've got uh, Beth Roberts, an old friend of the Midwest Writing Center and uh, excellent, excellent poet with her new book, Like You, out from Fence Books. Um, She'll be headlining the event with Shishman Collins, who is an MWC Press author of Flowing Water, Falling Flowers. It's really exciting. It's going to be her, um, her first reading outside of the virtual world. And um, she's so talented. It's a beautiful novel. Um, you can pick that up from Midwest Writing Center Press. And um, Kaylee Cool, who um, is a former intern from the Young Emerging Writers Internship, and she also won the um, University of Iowa Chapbook Prize in 2020. So um, super exciting. She's an excellent spoken word artist, an excellent, excellent poet. Um, and she'll be headlining that event as well. Uh, beyond that, of course, Roz Talks is amazing. We're going to be so, so pumped to see you in, in the flesh. Of course, um, we'll have masks. We'll keep safe distance from one another. But it's still really, really exciting to be able to do this. Um, what else do we have? We've got um, Birdies for Charity. Please, 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 if you're considering donating to the Midwest Writing Center, Birdies for Charity is the best way to do that because um, Birdies for Charity automatically adds uh, a 5% match to all donations, but also we have a couple of donors who are willing to match donations up to $10,000. So really your money is going to go way, way further in supporting the arts in our community if you donate through Birdies for Charity. We are Charity 1370. Um, and I'll throw the link to that in the, the chat as well, or the comments as well. Um, we've got the Collins Writers Conference coming up. June 24th through 26th, and um, it's going to be amazing. I talk about it a lot because I'm so excited about it. I have, ugh, I have books by all the others ugh, about eight feet away. I'm not gonna get up, get up and grab them. Um, but we've got Joe Mino on the short story. We've got Tarek Shaw on um, novel structure. We've got Liz Lenz on the personal essay. We've got Gail Marie Thompson on poetry and her class has the most beautiful title is Unabashed Gratitude in Difficult Times. I think that that is going to be a beautiful way to learn poetry and to become better at the craft. And then our keynote speaker and masterclass will be with Allison Joseph. Um, that is a really big deal. I'm very excited about all of this. These are all, um, I've read all of these writers. I admire all of these writers. I own their books. Um, cannot believe I get the opportunity to learn from them. Um, of course, we also have um, tuition assistance available for folks who are who are worried about that. Um, but the full conference price is, I believe, 270, um, which is really crazy. Again, this is all virtual this year. So anybody from anywhere can can join us, um, though you may have to set your alarm extra early for the for the early classes. Um, it's going to be incredible. Um, we're also finally returning to our Great River Writers Retreat. We'll have more details on that very, very, very soon. But um, the the winner of the Great River Writers Retreat gets to um, have a retreat at the um, oh gosh, I can't remember the name of the monastery over in um, it's near Black Hawk Park, <laughs> um, where they get to work on the project that they apply with, and then you'll headline your own reading. It's it's going to be really, really wonderful. We had to postpone last year's because we just didn't. Um, 
have the ability to to do safe accommodations and um we're really excited for that return you know we've got a lot of um a lot more understanding a lot um a lot more ease of of ability to be safe so it's gonna be really really wonderful and um i have always wanted to uh apply to that and i cannot so you should um that's all i'm going to uh say for now since i'm uh, not totally sure what else i have to share with you um so so excited to um have you with me today and i of course am going to challenge you now with your free right to write a letter um if you're not sure the focus of your letter i will add to um to write your letter to richard gear otherwise you know write to whomever or whatever makes the most sense to you i'm going to um sign off now i wish you all to write more light into your life